Okay, thanks. Thanks, Paula and the organizers for giving me this uh, honor to start the school <laughs> and almost finish the school because my second lecture is on Thursday, but it will still continue with a couple of talks after that. Uh, so, my talk is titled with a very generic title, Alignments on Banjo Number Representations. Uh, and this, is, this consists of actually four parts. Uh, so, I think it's natural to have breaks after each part to have a time for discussion on each, uh, each separate topic. Uh, so, part one is, uh, uh, is a kind of pretty high level overview of things to start with, something not very technical and uh, lightweight. So I'm just uh, showing you some challenges and some overview of the approaches that I will talk more detail in these other parts. And uh, I made some decisions on how to structure this uh, talk because I knew there are some other talks that will cover different topics. So I, I decided to limit myself on looking at only acyclic pension number representations. You will see what that means soon. These are basically sets of sequences, multiple sequence alignments, elastic degenerate strings, founder sequences, and graphs, and in general, DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, fall into this category. Uh, in some other talks, you will also hear about cyclic uh, graphs, like the brewing graphs and other, other things. Uh, after introducing these uh, challenges with working with these kind of structures, I will uh, talk about uh, dynamic programming on, on DAX, chaining of matches, not in a technical level yet, just uh, to see, show you the problems and some uh, uh, ideas of the solutions. And then in the end of this part one, I will uh, motivate one that why are we doing this whole thing with these things, uh, with an application of, of the techniques that we cover here uh, for enhancing various and calling accuracy. Okay, uh, so this will perhaps take this uh, something like first 45 minutes, then we can have a break, some discussion, and then you can mentally prepare yourself for a very technical talk. <laughs> another 45 minutes uh, talk on uh, but this is on a nowadays a bit classical technique so this is not about fan genomics per se but it's uh, about techniques that are needed in fan genomics so in this one I will just talk about very classical high throughput read mapping with Burroughs Wheeler indexes without I mean it's just having one reference genome uh, so not not any fan genome just uh, one reference genome uh, but the reason why I, have, I, I need to cover these classical things that, are, of course, things evolve during time, and now that we have a tension on representation of multiple sequences, of course, we need to extend these previous techniques to the, the new setting, and that's what I am doing in the part three. I am talking about hybrid indexing and uh, combining Lempel Sieb and Burroughs Wheeler techniques, and then some specific. A uh, nice new result, R index for repetitive collections. Uh, and then the last part, so this three and four will be on, on Thursday morning. Uh, and there I will continue a little bit different topic on coming back to this that I motivate you today, chaining of matches on tax. Uh, and I uh, concentrate on tax with small width that appear to be the case on uh, human band genomics, at least. And uh, about the technical content, that I, I sometimes assume something can be done, and I'm, I'm not going into details, so what I'm assuming uh, for granted is that uh, we can find maximally exact matches using something called bidirectional Burroughs Wheeler indexing fast. Uh, I think Yoni will talk something about these kind of techniques in, in his talks, like Jovni Siren's talks. And also what I'm not covering is minimizers. These are the new technique that has pretty much replaced everything that I talk in this part too. <laughs> <laughs> so 
it's a bit boring to have a technical talk like this and then nowadays all the tools don't use these but they use this minimizer. Uh, you will hear other talks, I, I'm pretty sure somebody will tell you what a minimizer is uh, during this uh, summer school. Uh, but I, I will show how to plug these things inside the things that I'm talking about. So they, the things I'm covering here will not be useless. They, they can be uh, maneuvered to work with minimizers. Uh, yes, and of course I tried a little bit uh, not cover things that other people will be covering. Uh, this is hard because we didn't really synchronize too much with the other speakers with a couple of emails just sending that. I will talk about this and please don't talk about this. <laughs> okay, uh, so one thing uh, if that will be common to all my talks here is that I, I'm uh, focusing on pretty old-fashioned algorithmic approaches. So I'm, I'm trying to define a problem very accurately that I haven't optimized this problem and I'm giving an exact solution so I, there's, a, yeah, there's a proof that this gives the optimal solution to this problem. Uh, so I, I work on this level but in practice uh, the practice is not like this of course. I mean there's a huge amount of heuristics to do things uh, uh, better in practice. But I'm not going into those. I'm trying to keep on this very al algorithmic level to have a clean concepts covered in, in these talks. Okay, so that's the overview of what I will be talking about. And now to the challenges and overview approaches. Uh, first, a complexity challenge. So the problem that my talk tries to tackle is uh, we would like to align a set of reads, sequence from a donor on a pensionum representation. I haven't yet told you what this pensionum representation is, but there are many options for this. Uh, the features that we know that we should have uh, to tackle this problem is that we need to be able to pre-process the pensionum, whatever that is. We need to be Reprocess it so that we can support very fast alignment of reads. There's no way to kind of scan through a pensionum representations for every read. That will take ages. So we need to have some, some clever data structure for the pensionum to be able to do this. Uh, so pre and also we cannot use uh, endless time for preprocessing. So both of these things should be near linear. Uh, time and also space to be feasible. So preprocessing should be nearly linear in the size of the pensionum and alignment should be near linear in the length of the read. So all the length of the whole set of reads that you have. Okay, so what do we know about this uh, from the literature is that uh, if you are given a read and a pensionum uh, represented as a graph, uh, it is actually possible to align this read to this graph, meaning that we, we are able to find a subpath of a graph that spells our uh, read, P, uh, spells some uh, sequence P prime that maximizes the alignment score of the read against this subpath. I will show it on the next slide how to do it. But uh, this algorithm to do this thing, it will, as far as I know, it always needs dynamic programming and the best we can achieve is quadratic time, even when this uh, graph is just a string, linear sequence. And also what do we know from the complexity theory literature is that uh, polynomial time indexing of a graph is not enough to find even exact occurrences of a read in a graph in subquadratic time. If this would be possible, there would be some surprising consequences in complexity theory. I'm not going into details of this, but these are related to strong exponential time hypothesis and orthogonal vector hypothesis. But here, let's first look at how to do it, this alignment even in quadratic time. I'm actually solving a little bit more difficult problem, so I'm here showing you an algorithm to align a graph against another graph. So you could think of this as a 
pan genome of, uh, of some uh, set of sequences and this another pan genome of another set of sequences and you would like to somehow align them to see whether they are similar pan genomes. Uh, <coughs> so, okay, if you define edit distance between graphs that will be an hard problem, so we can do it. But what we can solve efficiently is that you, it is possible to find a path through one uh, graph and another path through the other graph such that they have the best alignment among all possible pairs of paths. So even if there are exponentially many paths through these graphs, we can still find in quadratic time in the size of, size, sizes of these graphs uh, the optimal pair of paths that have a, the best alignment together. And now if you replace one of these graphs with a read, so just a linear sequence, because I claim that you can, you can do this for even if you have two graphs, you can certainly do it if you have one sequence and against the one graph. And here is the kind of a draft of the solution, uh, how, how you can do it, and I, I'm here Pretty much assuming you know how to do basic alignment, like Smith, Waterman, Needleman, Wunz. How many of you rec recognize these two algorithms? Okay, almost everybody, good. So, what you need to do is to extend those algorithms here. So, <coughs> now, since these are not just sequences, but these are graphs, you fix index mm -hmm. i, uh, meaning a node in the graph you put another index meaning a node in the other graph and then you look at uh, you would like to define a scoring uh, uh, matrix that tells you that uh, this uh, dynamic programming matrix tells you that uh, sij is the best score maximum alignment score of all pairs of paths ending at i and j this is what you want to compute. So this is a quadratic size uh, in a number of nodes. So number of nodes here times number of nodes here. Uh, and if you are able to compute fast every single entry of this, then you have a fast algorithm to align these graphs. And here's the recurrence, roughly. What you can use is that you just look at all the in-neighbors of this i. So i prime, i prime prime, and i three prime. These have edges towards here, and then you look at the in neighborhood of this node, J prime, J prime prime, and you look at all combinations of these incoming edges. They are listed here, or some of them, and each one of these combinations tells you some some way how the previous alignment should end. So, for example, if you assume that you already know that the best alignment ending at I prime and J prime is computed here then the only possibility is that you will align t to t and you add the score of that alignment here. And the same thing for other pairs, i prime prime, i prime prime against j, j prime and you add this uh, score of the aligning t to t against t. And at the same way you can handle the deletions in those, just like in the smith waterman needleman algorithms. Uh, so what is the time complexity of this one? What, any, does any, anybody want to tell uh, what is the total time running time of this kind of algorithm? What do you think? Bad. Oh, it's bad, but <laughs> it's, it's not completely useful. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. So it, the whole running time is the number of edges in this graph times the number of edges in this graph. So it's quadratic in the number of edges. This algorithm. Okay. So this algorithm was giving you a global alignment, uh, but I give you as an ex exercise to modify this algorithm to to map a sequence on a DAC 
uh, okay, I already hinted, just replace one of these graphs as a with the sequence or with a path, uh, and you add a suitable initialization like in the Smith Waterman algorithm. So you can align, uh, so you can do kind of semi semi uh, semi global alignment. So you can align this sequence at any part of this. So think of this G is the pangenon. This is a huge graph. And this is just a short read. So then obviously you need to align this, try to align this to all possible places in this pangenon. And you can do it with this approach by modifying just the little bit this uh, recurrence here. Okay, but as I mentioned, this is a, I, 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 like he was mentioning that this is something we don't want to do because this will take forever to run. So how, what do we do with this challenge? Uh, how do we deal with this uh, bottleneck that quadratic is somehow impossible to break? Uh, well, we can, uh, I mean, this is all, only infeasible if you, if uh, if the graph is such that you cannot index it, so you could actually focus on pangenom representations amenable to indexing. Uh, you can focus on practical performance. Uh, for example, you can devise an algorithm that has very good best case uh, behavior or even expected case performance behavior. Uh, and it's always better than an algorithm that only has a, always achieves the worst case. Like, like in this case, this algorithm is always achieving the worst case. It never, on any, any pair of inputs, it, it never does better than the quadratic time. But in principle, there might be an algorithm that is able to uh, align these graphs faster. And indeed, there are algorithms like that that have a better best case guarantee. For example, if these two graphs are very similar to each other, you can use this kind of diagonal, diagonal improvements in a alignment that you only compute the dynamic program matrix close to the diagonal. And if they are very similar, you only need to fill part of the dynamic programming matrix that has a best, uh, good, better best case complexity, that kind of algorithm, depending on the final outcome of the alignment. Okay, uh, yes, so you can do that. But then another thing is that uh, you can also loosen your uh, goals that you don't want to have the final best alignment, but you are happy with, with a good alignment. Uh, and actually my lecture will cover all, I mean, these approaches that I will uh, handle here, they are pretty much a combination of all these kind of things. So here is a very, like a classical, uh, but still very much used approach for uh, going beyond quadratic. Uh, so I think this was first proposed in uh, PASTA algorithm uh, that uh, was preceding BLAST. And then after that, it's uh, pretty much used in all alignment algorithms uh, that mm -hmm. work pra in practice uh, fast enough to be feasible. So here we have two strings A and B. Uh, you can first find this uh, K, for example, the, uh, the common K mirrors that they share in common. Uh, so substrings of fixed length K uh, that they have in common, and you you plot you can plot these in this two-dimensional chart, telling that the projection here, this part of uh, string A matches the projection in this part of B here. And uh, in the first case, there could be still quadratic amount of these k mirrors. Uh, but if k is large enough, then there are less. But of course, you're losing accuracy in the alignment. So that's why uh, many practical tools like BLAST, they, they, they try to use a short enough k. But then they allow some approximation that you look at the, the, the Hamming neighborhood of, of k mirrors and uh, also take those matches into account. Or in the most recent methods, you look at the common minimizers set by A and B. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll omit this part. You will uh, later learn, but basically it's a way to kind of uh, 
make this kind of matrix more sparse. Another way is that you can find maximal exact matches. So rather than fixing a length k uh, of exact match between two strings, you allow any length matches. So for example, if, if these two strings match here, but they could still match if you extend this uh, uh, di diagonal, so this projection gets longer, uh, you try to extend as far as possible and also to the left hand side. And when you cannot extend anymore, you say that, okay, this is no, no longer a match here. And this is what is called a maximally exact match. So computing those is always better than fixing a gamer. Uh, but uh, the, the downside is that fi finding these maximally exact matches needs more uh, difficult algorithms to find them. So gamers, you can use hashing and all kind of efficient techniques like that. But but this, as far as I know, you always will need techniques that I will be covering, like Paros with the transform, suffix arrays, that kind of things. Okay, but whatever this, uh, what I call a general name, anchor, so this could be some uh, substring that approximately matches this part here, uh, rather than an exact match like here. Uh, if you have, have some efficient algorithm to find them, there is a nice uh, a technique called collinear chaining of anchors that finds an optimal chain of these uh, sort matches that you can then uh, project into an alignment. So what you basically do is that you align these these parts here between the consecutive anchors in your chain, uh, but since they are already on very short distance and you know properly how they align, you can do this uh, fast, this, uh, this, this part of the alignment. So as far as you find this chain that gives you the kind of a, a rough idea of the good global alignment A and B, then you can fill these gaps using dynamic programming if you wish. And the good thing is that these are no longer quadratic, these algorithms. But uh, if, if your input are these anchors, you can have n log n time algorithms for this thing. And I, I will present uh, on Thursday one of such algorithm, not today, because I wanted to have this first lecture just on the overview of the things. Uh, but for example, if you have a fast, fast algorithm to find all maximal exact matches between A and B, this kind of, there is a chaining formulation uh, that gives you actually optimal edit distance as a result. So it's guaranteed to give an optimal alignment. So these are not just, I mean, one, one can see these as a heuristics to get behind the quadratic time, but actually they, if you, if you define them properly, you, some of these at least can be turned into, into optimal alignments, guaranteed optimal alignments as well. Okay, then uh, about this uh, model that I'm uh, talking about when I talk about pantheonome representations is that, or acyclic pantheonome representations, mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, conceptually at least I, I start from multiple sequence alignment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe I ask here how many of you know what a multiple sequence alignment is? Everybody? Good. I, uh, I, I picked the correct assumption, was <laughs> background of the audience. Okay, uh, uh, so, <clears throat> well the thing is that uh, we, we don't need uh, an optimal multiple sequence alignment to start with, which would be bad because it's an empty hard problem. We just need some good enough multiple alignment to, to do the business with. And such thing you can get, for example, if you have a reference and then you have a VCF files of many haplotypes. So they tell that uh, in this haplotype I have at position 500 a snip A to C against the reference and so forth. Uh, and once you have that information, it's not too difficult to construct somewhat realistic multiple alignment. There are algorithms to convert VCF uh, to multiple uh, BCF and reference into a multiple alignment. Uh, <coughs> uh, of 
of course, no, no, with no guarantee of the optimality, but at least they, they tend, to, <laughs> tend to be good enough. Uh, so for this talk, I assume that we have done this part already. We have got the reference, we have the VCF files, and there's an algorithm to convert that information in the multiple sequence alignment. Uh, and after that, uh, what you can do is that uh, you can find, you can define any segmentation of this multiple sequence alignment by columns, and that segmentation will always induce a graph. And how it does induce a graph is that here I have a split this uh, in two places, so I have uh, three segments. If I look at the first segment here, and I look at what strings that it, does it infer, it's only ACCT or ACAP. Uh, so for these two strings, I create nodes here. I take the next, next segment, I do the same thing, and I will get strings CCTA, CPCTAA. And for the final block, they share the same EGT common, so it's just create one node. Uh, and then I create etsys if this uh, concatenation is supported by the multiple uh, sequence alignment, meaning that there's at least one row that uh, contains this sequence at this position. ACAT, CCDAA, for example, here. So I create these etsys like this. And this uh, is what we call elastic founder graph. I don't know, maybe somebody in the audience do have any other name for this piece. <laughs> I explain why I talk about this like uh, with elastic, I mean elastic and founder thing soon, but if you recognize this from some other literature, maybe it would be nice to hear that. Uh, Okay, so the reason why, I, why this is called like this is that uh, the first name elastic comes from, from the fact that obviously you don't want to see the gaps in this uh, representation because when you are aligning, this is our pension representation and when you are aligning reads on it, meaning that you try to find paths through this graph, you don't care where the gaps were originally, it's just read through them. Uh, and this elastic comes from the thing that inside one block you have strings of different length. And there used to be uh, uh, something called degenerate string, defined uh, some 10, 20 years ago, that was almost like this, except that uh, you had this, um, this uh, you had a string that had these as symbols. So it was string of string of a set string, string of sets, uh, and it was called degenerate string because and in that one the restriction was that these uh, strings inside the same set were of the same length, and then this was extended to elastic de degenerate strings where you allowed these to be of different length. So that's the connection to earlier literature on. Uh, elastic de de degenerate strings and actually on this example if you just add one edge here you will get this elastic de de degenerate string because then you have all co uh, connections in this graph and this is just what the elastic de degenerate string means that you can start from any block and go to any block on the next level. Okay so that's for the elastic and for the founder uh, Part. The reason is that there's a connection to literature on founder sequences. So, for example, if you make a path cover of this graph, you take this uh, path and this path so that you are this path, these two paths cover all the nodes of the graph. You get two sequences, and these sequences have a nice property that they explain the original MSA completely. So, you can start from this original MSA rows start reading them, uh, and there's always one of these bounder sequences that you can follow, and on this bounder you may have to jump to the next one, and so forth. But you can read out all the rows of here by reading forward, maybe jumping to another one of a uh, few positions. And there's literature on these bounder sequences so that uh, you can try, you want to find a minimum set of bounders that explain your MSA. Uh, or you find, try to find a minimum uh, 
set of founders that explain your MSA having a least amount of uh, these recombination events. So there's a, quite a lot of papers on that kind of problems. Unfortunately, that problem is NP hard. <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, if we walk through this route, uh, uh, taking a segmentation here, making this graph, finding a path cover here, we obtain a feasible solution for this problem. It's not perhaps the optimal, but it's some solution. And there are some papers, I have one paper on, at least on this uh, route, that you do this way, you optimize some, uh, this, some properties of this segmentation, and you optimize some properties of this path cover. For example, you want to take those edges that are most supported that they have more rows supporting this connection in the path cover and this you can do in polynomial time. So you end up with, with quite a, a nice uh, 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 set of founder sequences that are much larger, mu much smaller than this one. For example, we applied this on, uh, I don't remember the, the exact details. Uh, I think we, we took the 1000 genome data, 5000 something haplotypes. Uh, on, from one chromosome and we applied some optimization here and we got uh, in total 130 founders out of it. And this, uh, this founder sequences had a property that if you try to al uh, align these uh, rows of the original 1000 times the chromosome length MSA to that one, you needed to only jump every 9000 phases. So you could read out one, one row here 9,000 patients and then some on average. And that was a good news because if you use... So we would like to use this as a uh, pan-genome representation, meaning that we could index this, uh, align reads on top of, top of this one, and if you do that with, for example, 100 base pair reads, you do the math, you notice that you are guaranteed to find, I think, something like 98% of all the reads uh, aligning to this uh, this uh, representation compared to aligning them to this whole MSA. So it, it can be used for that purpose. And I, I will show some uh, results on this kind of approach. Mm -hmm. Then some special cases. So if you take just one segment in a segmentation, you get just a set of sequences. So ignoring gaps here, your pangenome is just a set of sequences. And there are a lot of algorithms working on that uh, kind of uh, representation, and I will cover on Thursday lecture those kind of developments. If you segment up at every single column, you basically get a variation graph that you could get by applying the var variance from the VCF files directly to the reference without going through this route of multiple sequence alignment. So that's the that's the overall picture that I'm going to talk about uh, in, this, uh, in these lectures. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> so I will talk about indexable acyclic transgenome representations. Uh, so in general, one can find uh, elastic founder graphs and elastic de generated strings uh, to be as hard to index as general DAGs. So, this, I mean, directly there's no benefit on these graphs, but you can set additional constraints to this uh, segmentation uh, so that you can uh, index these graphs. But this is some ongoing research we do with actually my student there, Nicola, <laughs> in this Alpaca network. Uh, so, we already have some papers with my previous PhD students also on this, uh, but I don't want to talk about this here. I, I want to concentrate on research done by others, basically. So, I, I, yeah, I think, uh, uh, or some, some like more classical results than things that are still evolving at the moment. So, so I'm actually mostly concentrating on indexing just a set of sequences. It's very simple model, but already that gives us a headache enough. Okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, well on time, so I think we are approaching the break now. So I'm 
soon ending the part one. Uh, so I just wanted to show in the uh, end of this part uh, some motivational results that why are we bothered uh, talking about pensional representations and aligning reads on them. Uh, so this is now uh, using the approach that I was mentioning, using founder sequences as pensional uh, representation. So what you can do with them is that you can uh, you can uh, first construct them using some optimization of their uh, qualities, uh, and then you uh, align all the reads from a donor uh, to this kind of pensional representation, meaning just simply aligning all the reads to these two sequences uh, to the best possible place where they align to, using some classical techniques for, for aligning strings to uh, reference sequences. And let's say that they, they cover these areas in these two sequences. You can convert these alignments into uh, coverage counts. So these are just numbers telling that at this position in the first sequence you have three reads uh, aligning over it. Uh, for, and this already reveals you that this data probably ha this is a diploid individual that happens to have both allele G and C at this position. Four. And also here, probably this person has uh, both alleles D and A because these uh, reads align over this D nicely and they, they align also nicely when there's an A here. So you can already reveal the variants that are in the pan genome, that are encoded in the pan genome by using this approach. What we did in addition to this that we, we took the heaviest path Okay, I forgot this part. So they were, the reads were only aligning on top of this one here. So they only supported this uh, allele G here, not, not the C. So we can infer all this information from just this simple approach here. Uh, what we don't yet get is that uh, what are the novel variants this donor might have that is not part of the pensionum. And for that, what we did is that we, we took just the simple heaviest path through this uh, alignment uh, pile up and construct, constructed something we call ad hoc reference, just reading these nucleotides in the same order as here, uh, based on the counts, and using a standard alignment, so we realigned all the same reads on top of this uh, ad hoc uh, reference and find out that there is a all the reads here, they align with one of these maps here, and they support uh, nucleotide C here, and we call, call that one as well. So this is the approach we, we, we took. And here are the results. Uh, so we first did a very uh, naive uh, uh, kind of simulation experiment to show that this works. Uh, so we did a forward simulation on the evolution of E. coli. So we created binary tree of depth 10 with uh, some X percent of mutation and its uh, node. And then we took up from the leaves of this binary tree that have, have now mutations. Uh, we took one out and its uh, siblings and the parent, I think, uh, and simulated 10x coverage reads on, on this, uh, on this uh, uh, artificial genome that we created. But the rest that we had in this binary tree, we added them in the multiple sequence alignment and we constructed the founders. And using this approach that I was showing here, we generated this ad hoc reference. And since this ad hoc reference in this case, when there's, there are just homogeneous uh, mutations, this would be pretty accurate uh, representation of the do hidden donor that we had in the background that we didn't know. So we, we compare this ad hoc genome to the hidden one. So we try to see whether we can infer the hidden genome using this approach. And we did pretty well. So uh, varying the mutation rate, our approach got uh, some edit distance 100 or something like that from the hidden donor. When we did the same, generated the ad hoc reference using uh, GATK or PCF tools. 
so that they use some of the references, you know, not, not the, the, the other parts of the evolutionary tree, they, they were doing worse, much worse. And I think the solid lines here, now the dashed lines here are when you index the whole MSA, and the solid lines are the ones where you just uh, index the founders. So we got pretty the same results in both uh, ways. And the good thing is that this MSA is now the huge piece that we don't want to index. We only want to index these founders that are much less and manageable, so we can do it. And then uh, we went on and applied the same technique on uh, human, uh, human genomes. We took the MSA from 1000 Genomes project, project generated founders, trees from Illumina Platinum Genomes project, project and then uh, the ground truth variants from the Genomina Photo project. And these are the SNP genotyping precision and recall uh, results. So they have the baselines, they are pretty, pretty good. Uh, here are our approaches and I mean there's almost no no difference in the results here. I will soon explain why. And also the same thing if you took the competitors graph typer tool. It's a Bruin graph based tool and then BG variant graph tool. Uh, I mean pretty much you can get the same precision on recall these graph based tools. I've got a little bit less uh, good results here. But I don't show you here the Intel calls where things are clicked a bit. So I think graph typer did really well on, on Intel's there. But the thing, the thing with this experiment is that uh, these uh, baselines are pretty much using GATE as the tool to generate the ground truth. So it's almost impossible to beat it in this kind of experiment because it, it's used to generate the ground truth. So that's why we did something else to show the benefit of this approach. We used the same MSA from 1000 Challenge project. We took the, but now we took the reads from a, an individual from the Simon's Genome Diversity Project and checked that this individual was not a close relative to the 1000 Genomes people. Uh, and, but the downside is that now we cannot com compare the precision recall because there's no ground truth. So what do we do? Uh, we, we could do this indirectly only. Uh, we compared the quality of the read mappings on this ad hoc that we created using uh, this, uh, our tool, using founders and uh, alignments on the standard preference. And here we get a really big uh, improvement. So for example, we could align this many more. So this uh, blue bar here is our tool and this is the baseline. So with zero edit distance, we got a huge amount of reads that could be mapped completely exactly uh, on, on this uh, the reads that were taken here could be aligned exactly in this case. And it's the same thing when the edit distance grows. We always got to align more reads, which probably means that they are aligning, aligning more easily and better to the correct position. We don't know whether they are correct position, but that's what you can infer here. Okay, I think that's good time to have a small break until we go to the technical talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, could so it could be the TNC could be in both places. Uh, I don't see it. 
what are some? The four and the fifth letter of the TLC, I guess it could be either of the Oh yeah, yeah, they could be either, either way. The right yeah, side. they could be either way, yes, yes. It could not affect this one. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Thanks very much. This is really great. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. Does it matter how you your rules for how you where you draw your vertical dotted lines? Like what's your approach for choosing where to draw the vertical lines? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That one I completely omitted here. So so I I'm just telling that whatever your segmentation is, it always ends up with a graph like that. Uh, but uh, we found that there are, there are nice ways to optimize these segment boundaries by dynamic programming, and that they can be actually done in linear time. So, in the to total size of this graph, you can do the linear time to find an optimal segmentation that optimizes some something like the height of this uh, this pattern of representation. Uh, so. So that you try to minimize the number of uh, uh, different sequences in, in one block. Uh, and I, that's a good approach, for example, if you the, after that do the path cover, then it's guaranteed to have a, only a few paths that cover the, the path channel if you do it like that. Uh, yes. But yeah, I, I'm not going on those details, but I can, I can tell you privately <laughs> what you can do with those. Yeah, so, so the approach you take is that you um, essentially create a new reference genome rather than, yeah. rather than use the old reference genome, right? Yeah. So I, I think this is very interesting because, uh, you know, the, in biomedical sciences, people are very conservative. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and they, will, they will use a tool like GATK, well, you know, well, yeah. all the diets are bursting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so this, this could be like an intermediate phase where people get you know to accept the fact that the reference genome is not so great for many things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but do you do you already have application? I mean, do people are people starting to use this or? Uh, we have a paper published. Mm -hmm. I don't see many. I mean, the fair of the citation is not not growing really high. So, so yeah, but we have a tool. Tools. So we published the tool. By informatics last year, uh, that uses this founder approach, yeah. and it's really plug and play. You can put it on top of uh, GAPK or whatever you like, so it's compatible with those. Just needs a bit of <coughs> coding. coding yeah. Right. yeah. So, so have, have you have you tried it with, for example, cancer tissue? Uh, we will not yet, but. Uh, Actually, so the student who was uh, the main author of this one, he's going to continue in a, in a cancer research uh, lab. He just defended the thesis and is going there next year. So he, that's what he's going to do there. Yeah, it could be interesting. I am a supervisor of the business of transplant truth. It's very, it is difficult. Yeah. If you go to the, you know your slide where you did um, uh, you took the thousand genomes, yeah, and you. So this one, yeah. Yeah. So there is a there is a there is a way where you can compare yourselves without using GA to Okay. If you, so it's a pain because humans are diploid. Yeah. So the mismatch might be yeah. legit. But if you get there are some uh, places where they've managed to sequence. Uh, uh, well, actually. Uh, Human that never survived that was haploid. Mm -hmm. So you have a haploid truth, and then if you just map to your genome, mm -hmm. any mismatches are fused together, and you can compare the number of mismatches in your mapping to the mismatches with GHK. Okay. And then that's black and white evidence of your being secure. Okay. Okay. Do you have any reference? Where yeah, you find this information yeah. that would be cool. Yeah. I have a question about um, when you talk about the uh, graph to graph uh, alignment. Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, in this case, you, you kind of understand that the usual alignment methods for the graph and you lose complexity. Yeah. And do you know if like more complicated 
science techniques. Uh, are they as well easy to conceptually to extend to graphs? Like get the get penalty or something like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. I does anybody know? I mean it could be that cut cut off cut off uh the pronoun this uh that does upwind gaps. It might be feasible to do here, but, uh, but one has to be careful there. I mean, there are always details that might break the make, uh, break the dependency so that it doesn't work anymore. But at least the Smith Water money you can extend here. But I don't know what the more fancy alignment algorithms they might break easily. This kind of yeah, yeah, man. I would suspect that they break because the thing is that you need to remember how long distance it's uh, from the previous uh, where you open the gap and extend the gap. But now that you have a, it's not linear anymore. You have many paths that could end up there. It might uh, kind of create some anomalies that you cannot solve by dynamic programming. Yeah. The the other difference is that you explain from the music to the different alignment to the graph. Uh, it's too different from the ones that you could explain without using multiple things alignment. Is there any reason? Uh, so how would you get them without the MSA? Uh, that was my question. Yeah. This solution would be an approximation of the one obtained without the system. For example, in DSD, the this model paper where they uh, find a solution of the standard set. Yes. Uh, yes. With the flow. Yeah, 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 right, right. I remember, yes. I also attended that talk. Yeah, I think, I mean, this path cover. When you solve, you can reduce it into a flow problem and solve the flow. So they might be doing quite similar things, but in their case, they, they have a cyclic graph, and it was more difficult in that case to solve solve that problem. So when you have a DAG, you can solve this efficiently always. But they had a cyclic graph, and I think they need to use ILP uh, formulas to get it correct. I are you? Yeah. Okay, are you relaxed enough for the yeah. get the burden of the technical part? <laughs> I hope there's something uh, you know already. So. Uh, okay, so this is a talk that I gave uh, in 2009, first time, in ISMB as a tutorial. And while I was giving it, there was a like a there was a I was competing with uh, uh, Ben Langmead, I think <laughs> he was on the neighboring room uh, uh, advertising bow tie, <laughs> and you can guess there was like a, the audience but had a little bit mixed feelings on which one to participate. Uh, so yes, I think uh, Ben got a larger audience, <laughs> yeah, much larger. Hugely uh, popular presentation. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, but, but basically, all things I cover here are something that ha haven't changed after 2009. Uh, until the very end, I present something new. And you might have heard of these things uh, before in your lectures. But just to get all the people like uh, to the same base, basically, I want to cover this uh, starting from the basics. Uh, yes, and I, this is based on a, on a book uh, we brought, wrote with Jamal Pelatsoki, Papia Kunila, Alexander Thomas, and a bit later than that. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the basics. So, read mapping. Uh, you have your input is a set of sort reads extracted from a donor DNA. Output is uh, alignment of the reads to their locations in the reference genome. Some errors, but not too many, need to be allowed in the mapping. 
Uh, this is the first kind of uh, practical classical solution you can you can find for this backtracking with suffix three. Uh, so suffix three is a tree structure where you look at the re reference genome, you take all the suffixes starting at any position, reading all the way through to the end, and you insert them as paths on a tree structure. And when you have the same string, you will follow exactly the same deterministic path on, on that kind of tree. And what you can do there is that you can explore all the suffixes that match your pattern by, by doing some kind of a ransom bar uh, traversal over there. Uh, so let's go into details how to do this. Uh, so this suffix tree is a compressed keyword tree of all suffixes of the sequence. So if, for example, if your reference is C-A-P-A-C-P, these are all the suffixes, and you just insert them one at a time into your tree structure. Uh, but you should do some compression there, that uh, whenever you, there's no branch, you just uh, read uh, the substring from, from the sequence rather than creating a node or it's for it's it's simple. Uh, in the leaves you associate the position where the string that you spell from the root, for example A C P, uh, it's starting at position one, two, three, four. So you put the link to it in the leaf of this tree. This tree will have exactly as many leaves as you as is the length of the reference. And since you do this compaction, that the, there's no, <coughs> these unary paths are compressed into subs, substrings, then the number of internal nodes you have is uh, at most n minus 1, where n is the number of leaves. The worst case is when you have fully balanced binary tree as a result. Uh, okay, this is another illustration, so these are the links to the corresponding positions. And these strings that are on the edges, you don't really need to represent them as sequences. You can always have them as a substrings of the original text. So for example, the CD, it appears here, so you just represent it as a pair substring from position 5 to 6. And that's how all your edges and nodes and all the information in the tree can be stored in uh, with uh, basically pointers or uh, integers, so you only need something like order of n integers to represent this tree. So this is not enormous, I mean it's a big structure, but not, not like a completely unfeasible. Uh, and this backtracking that I was illustrating, here is a concrete example, so if you want to search ACA with one mismatch on your string, you can do it using the suffix tree by starting from the root, and going to all directions. Uh, if you go here, you can report uh, whenever you have a mismatch. A matches A, C matches C, A, T doesn't match A, so you get one mismatch here. But that was your goal, to have all one mismatch uh, uh, matches, so you report four at the position where you match. And that's where you branch to all directions, and you just memorize how many mistakes you made on the way. And whenever the number of mistakes exceeds your threshold, you stop. So that's the like, one solution for read mapping. Uh, and this is a very generic approach, so you can, uh, you can even do dynamic programming on these paths. Uh, you can extend Smith-Water 1 position specific scoring matrices, regular expression, search for whatever. You can use the same idea here. But the problem is that you might need to traverse the whole tree in the end. So you might not save any time. Actually, you might get even worse time than just scanning the text in the first place. Okay. Uh, here are some properties. So it takes linear space. It can be constructed in linear time. I'm not covering an algorithm to do this, but there are some algorithms for doing that. Uh, if you implement this in a, like a uh, not very optimized way, you will, uh, you will observe that human genome, suffix tree of a human genome will require 200 gigabytes of space. So it's quite big, quite bad. Uh, if you engineer a bit, you can get down to 40 gigabytes. Uh, but uh, 
actually that you mentioned on Excel, uh, if, they, if you form recipe cheap or something like that, that it will take less than one gigabyte. Uh, and well, actually, this standard uh, just using two bits per one page per will get you to one gigabyte already. So, we, in this approach, we are like a blowing up the space like four lines. And this was established before Power Street of Transform was invented. This was the only way to do this thing. And uh, that's why later, as we learn, uh, our field of transform changed the game completely because we could get an index that was roughly of the same size as the plane and coding. Okay. There were some attempts to reduce the space before this power field of transform. Transform one was the suffix array that you get rid of the topology of the tree to just keep the leaves of the tree. But you ensure that you make the suffix tree so that uh, always the leftmost band is the smallest in lexical graphic order. So these are the sorted suffixes in the lexical graphic order, and then you have some, something sorted, you can always do binary search. So, so, for example, I don't know if I have an example here, but if you are searching for AC, you would try uh, the suffix in the middle, 5. You compare it AC to CP and now it's a bit smaller, so you could go this side to compare it here, uh, PA, so you have to go uh, still to the left and then you find that it matches this uh, score here, AC. Okay, and basically, if you have suffix array and a couple of additional arrays, uh, you can simulate suffix really nicely. But it doesn't solve the space issue. Uh, you are still ending up something like 40 gigabytes of space in the end. So what I try to explain to you now in the rest of the time I have left is that you can do the same backtracking using corporate suffix arrays so using just 2.1 gigabytes of space in practice. And this is using the Thorosville transform. So how many of you know Thorosville transform? Okay, now I, I'm getting a little bit less hands, but still a lot. So I think I should still uh, cover this uh, basics. Uh, so Thorosville transform is uh, <coughs> really so that you make a matrix M whose rows are cyclic sets of, of sequence, your input sequence. So they take the last letter and you put it to the beginning and you have a new string of the same length. You do all these cyclic sets and and finally you sort this M in lexical graphic order and then you look at the last column of this matrix and the first column of this matrix and this somehow encoded for the Horus field transform. So, okay, let's not uh, look at the formal definition but an example. So, uh, because this uh, lexical graphic order of the side exit is essentially the suffix array of the sequence except that you need to add a special end marker to the string to have a full correspondence. Uh, <clears throat> so you, when you make the cycle shifts of this one, and you have a special marker that is smaller than all other symbols, what happens when you compare the cycle shifts in lexicographic order that whenever you hit the end marker, you already know that this one is smaller. So you don't need to read through the sequence. In this site, it's if the interesting part is before this uh, end marker. And, and this Poros field transform is then this last column of the matrix of uh, sorted site uh, exits. Uh, and if people have more time, I would give you an exercise that. Uh, if you are given just this uh, last column here, not the whole matrix, uh, and the row where the string appears in the, the original string appears in the lexicographic order, uh, I would ask you how to compute the original string and the suffix array uh, fast using just this information. But since we don't have a luxurious time to do exercises here, I'm just showing the, to the solution. Uh, so if this is the situation where you start, you have a, only the last column of the matrix and everything else is empty. 
And what I'm doing, I'm going to stable sort these uh, symbols here. And I memorize where the, all the symbols go. I, I know that M1 goes here, first day goes here, second day goes here, and so forth. And after that, I start cycling shifting the, this one over here. I start there. And I use the cycling shift of that one, but because I record it where it goes, I can follow it there. And I can reload the first. Uh, Entry the suffix array. Well, actually, the suffix array entry that is, uh, happens to now be the electric graphic bit smallest, and that starts at position 7 in the sequence. And also, I get the information that the string ends, so I get it now in reverse order, I know it ends with end marker. And I continue like this, I follow this mapping that I recorded, and I will reveal the suffix array 1 at the time. And I also get a string in reverse order uh, using this mapping. And this is the LF mapping. Uh, so you can simply do the stable sorting or during, during it, you can record this kind of mapping. Okay, the only thing is that we don't want to store this mapping because it's as, as big as the suffix array. So we don't, are not saving any space. So instead of that, we try to simulate it. So this is just reported. Repeating what I said already. Uh, so, how to replace it? That we do a couple of observations that this LF mapping has some nice property, properties that if, if we uh, compute so called count array, uh, that for every symbol we count the number of symbols more or smaller than that one in the sequence, input sequence T, uh, then we know that this LF of uh, with uh, parameter i, it will map to this range that we can take from a, directly from this table, the start of it and the end, end, end of that range. And then, if you divide, define something called rank uh, uh, with parameter c on this sequence L and uh, position i, uh, be the amount of symbol c in the prefix of this sequence L, uh, then you can notice that the select mapping can be uh, fine tuned. So rather than knowing the range where it lands, you can actually compute the exact position adding this uh, rank to this uh, start of the boundary. And also, we can prove that if we stable sort this uh, Aroswila transform, last column of the uh, sorted matrix, sorted uh, uh, cited sits. This table sorted thing in this uh, sequence L prime, then this Li will be mapped to exactly that position there. And how to prove this? Uh, this is actually pretty obvious. That uh, if you look, if you take strings, so x c, so x is some string, and c is a symbol. If you know that x c is smaller than y c then you know that x, x must be smaller than y because they have the last symbol the same so the difference must be earlier and if you append or prepend x and y with the same symbol you also retain the same order mm -hmm. and this is the observation why this uh, computation of element mapping can be separated in two parts because we know that uh, this matrix M will have all the cyclic sets of all the all the uh, all the cyclic sets of the string. So there must be so for all rows ending with C, there has to be as many rows starting with C as well. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't find them any, anywhere. Uh, and this sorting, uh, stable sorting gives you the only bisectory map, mapping not leading to contradiction with this proper. Basically, if you take all rows that ends with M with C, and you make a cyclic sit from them to the right, uh, you will get rows that start with C, and they have to appear exactly on the same order as they appear uh, here. Because, for example, if this one is XC, and this one is YC, over here, and you make a cyclic sit, you use this argument and all this stuff, where they map to, it must, must uh, be on this same order. So you get that they have to be 
same order, and since uh, you have a white section between all rows that is in bit C to rows that is not in C, then it's the only outcome you that satisfies those right there. Okay, and this is written formally, and uh, this element mapping can be computed like this. Uh, okay, just an example of the computation. So, how do we get this suffix array, so Carlos Wheeler computed? Uh, we can start from suffix tree, uh, but there are also direct construction algorithms that compute them in linear time. And this bar, if you have the suffix array, you can always compute the Carlos Wheeler transform by a very simple conversion. Just take the suffix array value minus one and look at the position in the input sequence, and that's your height. Uh, or also the transform value. And then you can just take, take some uh, uh, look at the literature that how, how you can compute these rank values fast. So for bit vectors, there are data structures that occupy less than n bits, as you put it, uh, extra space that compute rank of binary sequences in a constant time. Uh, and then this Paros uh, transform can be replaced by a structure called Wheeler tree that occupies n of sigma space, as you put it, sigma is now in our way always 4 DNA sequence, so it's uh, 2 n uh, bits. And supports this rank basically in constant time in our case because it's log sigma. So you as well. Uh, and this structure data tree uses uh, this resultant binary uh, bit vectors in, in its internal workings. Uh, I probably, probably won't have any time to go through these ones. So they are in the lecture slides, and I will share the slides you can see them afterwards. Uh, but assuming this can be done, so now we have a representation of the Reference sequence that roughly takes the same state as the original sequence. Maybe two times more, something like that. Uh, so, so before doing the back tracking, I, I would make to introduce a couple of more concepts. Uh, so, we can uh, replace the whole suffix array with something called the compressed suffix array that occupies is uh, two times the sequence length times sigma times log of the sequence length times sequence length times log sigma. Okay, uh, but okay, I think this is the only significant part here. This is two times, probably two times the sequence length number bits in it. And you can compute every value of the suffix array in uh, log sigma log uh, sequence length time. And the idea is very simple, you store every log and suffix array value concretely, and then you use element mapping locally to find the nearest sample value. Uh, so here is an example of the computation. See, okay, I don't have an animation here. Uh, but what you do is that we only keep this one and the rank structures to be able to work the element mapping. Uh, then we sample every, let's say, third value, so let's say log n is 3 here. We sample the first suffix, uh, suffix starting at the first position, fourth position, and the seventh position, and we, we mark them in a bit vector with positions. So we put one, one set on positions that are sampled and zero when they are not sampled. So this we have, and this we don't have. Okay, but let's see that we, we want to be accessing a, a suffix array value here that is now gray. We don't know what the value is. So what we do is that we apply LF mapping once, twice, until we find a sampled value. And we have the sampled values in some uh, dense array. It's four, and since we took two, two steps, we have to have two to that value to get the number here. That's how we, we can get all the suffix array values. And this will take at most log n time because you are going okay, log n steps because that's the sampling factor and you get additional log sigma time from uh, because you need to support RAM on the 
is uh, porosity transform. Okay. Uh, yes, so this is just repeating what I said. So this is a compressed representation of suffix array using just the porous field transform. And now we are approaching the back, uh, backtracking part that we, I want to show you. Uh, so let's first see how we can do uh, backward search. Uh, so searching exactly whether a spring appears in a, uh, in a longer spring. So now I have a, my spring is uh, this one, cp, cat, cat, cp, and I want to see whether my cat appears in the spring. Uh, and if I have a suffix array, I could finally search it here to find that it's there. But since I only have the last column of this matrix, I need to use this Paros field matrix to find it. And what I do here is that the first step is that you just compute this range i to j, where all the suffixes start with the last symbol of your search. So all suffixes that start with t, you can compute from a pre-computed small table. And then what you are doing is that you use this rank function to locate. So basically what you will do here, we want to find all suffixes that start with a, t. And so if you could apply LF mapping on these two rows here, that end with a, you would be able to find all the suffixes that start with a, t. But you don't want to do it uh, uh, looking at, look at the range and do LF mapping on every possible position, because that would kill your running time. Uh, so what you observe that if you compute this what you would like to compute and replace it with this rank computation, you notice that you don't even need to know where the A's appear in this range because you can replace them with rank where it's just before the range and the end of the range. And this will give exactly the same result. So you only need two rank queries to be able to map this whole range to the suffixes that start with A, B, and they are here. And then you take one more step, doing exactly the same work as here, to find the final range here. Okay. So those of you that see this first time, I don't believe you can follow this. <laughs> but I have to be quick to move on to the kind of interesting parts, because I know that many that already have this materialized them in their back home. Okay. So this is uh, just saying the same things in uh, formulas. Uh, another example that I will skip. I just want to show you the pseudo code that can be written in se seven lines of code, and I think you could just uh, write this in five, five minutes and run it and work. Okay, it means that you have already computed the parochial transform and this rank functions and all these things, but otherwise this would be the uh, very easy uh, algorithm. So you look at the last symbol in your query pattern, uh, and then you find the first range, and after that you uh, incrementally change this range to a smaller range, jumping in, in the parochial transform. And if your final range is uh, not empty, you tell that there was a match. If it's empty, you tell that didn't match there. Okay. Uh, I think to, in order to go to the more interesting part, so you can play around with this and uh, have even more functionality on top of the Poros uh, field transform, but it's pretty similar uh, to what we have seen. So I will go to this more interesting part because I, I think I should. <laughs> Close in seven minutes. Yes. Am I right? Yes. By my hand. Okay. Uh, so I just want to tell you like a little bit history of the things that if you have ever used these tools like here, I think I can explain all of them in a few slides how they work. Now, if you understood what I have so far. Uh, so these uh, tools are based on backtracking of Paros filter. So doing the same thing as we did with the subject, but now doing it in 
on top of Paros with a transform. So I will focus on KX and CIS problem. Uh, so finding whether a string appears allowing K plays with where they have mismatch. And now that you have seen how the exact search goes, this is very similar. So we have the range, so we have identified, for example, this pattern uh, backwards that it has a GC. All the suffixes that start with GC uh, are in this range. And then we would like to see whether we can extend with the last, last or first part of the pattern A. Okay, uh, so we can do this same uh, backward search step to find this range of all suffixes that match exactly with the pattern, uh, two exact occurrences. Uh, but since we allow one mismatch, we can also branch with the uh, symbol C and find that there are two occurrences with one mismatch. And we can also branch with G to find the other two occurrences over here. So that's it. It's uh, the same algorithm as exact search, except that you branch with all symbols. And this is the corresponding pseudo code you can write. Uh, so here, you, at every step, you move with all, all symbols you have. You uh, compute the range up as if you would be backward searching with S at that step. And if your pattern has the same symbol as that you are uh, branching on this Parosville transform, you don't uh, decrease the count of all errors. So you step, set, set the uh, uh, allowed errors in the beginning with uh, some threshold K and at every step if you make a mistake so the, the pattern has a different letter than you are branching on you decrease the counter and then if you haven't yet used all your allowed errors you, you branch to another part of the recursion with, uh, with the pre uh, like a previous step previous uh, position in the pattern and this new range and this uh, this is what you get. This will give you all the all the uh, approximate occurrences of the pattern. But how good is this? Uh, so uh, I implemented this at some point. This very algorithm, uh, and I was searching ten thousand patterns of length thirty two, zero, one, and two mismatches, and I noticed that the average search time was growing pretty heavily. Right? 4.3 with zero errors, 8.2 with one, and so on. So this is truly exponential search. Uh, okay. And that's why all these practical tools you use some techniques to avoid branching as heavily. So for example, DWA uh, that I just all of you know uh, is using uh, two uh Oros Wheeler indexes, O1 and reverse. They are also called FM indexes, these are popular indexes for some historic reasons. Uh, so, what they do is that they, they pre compute the table that tell, gives a lower bound to match the uh, prefix of the pattern. Uh, so, so when during the search, if you know that the remaining prefix of the pattern can no longer match with some amount of errors, then you can remember how many errors you already used and how much, how much you still uh, need to use. And if these two sum up, so if these two, two errors sum up with bigger than your threshold, then there's no way to find a mass over there. So that's what they did. And they needed these uh, two indexes because to compute some reasonable lower bound for this kappa function here, they were doing a uh, backward search on the reverse of the pattern and whenever they tried to do it exactly and when they got a mismatch they couldn't they got an empty interval if they tried to extend they could record uh, plus one this kappa function at that point and then they initialized the search again and they would finally get an array where this uh, lower bound values grow all the time until the end and that's how they, they were able to prune the search space and pretty much the reason why this algorithm works works in practice uh, well. 
There's some, there was another one. Okay. Okay, I have one minute only left, so uh, I think I have to close soon. But uh, <coughs> uh, there was another one that uses the same idea, uh, but in a, in a different way. So Cobalt was using the same idea, but uh, what is done there is that uh, you notice that if you have, for example, one mismatch, it can occur either in the beginning of the pattern or in the end. So if you can search four directions, like we can do with two indexes, then you just uh, like try both directions. So you search exactly the middle of the pattern and only then ramps, or you try the other way. One of them has to find the correct uh, uh, hit. But the problem with that one was that it always had a kind of bad category case. When you have, for example, two mismatches, you're going to have uh, the first mismatch in the beginning and the last one in the very end. So there's no, no good way to start the search, either beginning or end. They both will be bad. You always have to branch right away. But this was solved with so too using a technique called uh, bidirectional parasolar index. Uh, they noticed that you can actually jump directly to the middle of the pattern, start searching exactly, and then kind of continue to the same position but searching the other direction. And for that, you need to kind of uh, keep uh, the interval you have in the Forward FM index and in the FM index constructed for the reverse uh, sequence, you have to memorize these uh, intervals all the time during the search so, so that you can always decide that okay, now I actually want to jump to the other direction. And, I, and this is possible using some uh, other theories on the way tree very fast. So this doesn't uh, sacrifice the running plan at all, but it solves this uh, bad category case. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I can start from this on the next lecture. I don't need to cover it now, so I, I think we need a break. <laughs> Thank you.